The Building Better Business podcast is the best place to learn how to take your business to the next level. It's no longer enough to earn good profits. You need to develop a network of connections as well as use all types of marketing to your advantage that will put you over the edge. Hosted by me, Steve Eschbach, a financial executive with decades of experience in dealing with businesses and business people, we'll learn how this all comes together. Join me and my expert guests as we delve into the many facets of owning the business and how to become a good, caring business owner. Listen how making a difference in your community can attract all sorts of clientele, which in turn will build you a better business. Greetings, my fellow listeners, and welcome to another edition of Building Better Businesses. I am your host, Steve Eschbach. I am the owner of Transworld Business Advisors of Naperville. I am one of seven local Transworld business owners. We are a global business brokerage firm. We are the largest in the world, and we are also the fastest growing. We've only been around for about 40 years. And what we do is we assist business owners confidentially sell their businesses and match them to qualified buyers. A couple of other things we do is that uh, we do uh, franchise sales. So anyone looking to get into the entrepreneurial market and looking for an established presence, we can help you with that. Franchise sales is what we do. And then last but not least, we also do franchise development. So if you are a business owner looking to expand via the franchise model, one of my sister subsidiaries has done probably close to 1500 worldwide in the past 30 to 40 years. So we've got the expertise to get you from initial marketing to documentation, to getting your next franchisee owners up and running. But today we're not going to talk about me. Today we're going to talk about the uh, the Uber land lawn care service, which I didn't know there was such a thing, but there is one. And I'm delighted to have Brian Clayton with us today, who is the uh, owner of Green Pal. So Brian, I welcome you to the show. Thank you so much. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, I am founder of a company called Green Pal, which is the Uber of lawn care. So if you're a homeowner and you need to get your grass cut, rather than calling around on Craigslist or Yelp or Home Advisor or, or on the internet, you can just download our app and somebody will come out and cut your grass and you can pay them right through the app and book them for services for the whole season. Been at this business for eight years. I guess you could say we're kind of an eight-year overnight success. My two co-founders and I have been grinding on building the marketplace. Uh, we have finally got it over 200,000 people using the app every day doing over $20 million a year in sales. Uh, but it started out very small, very humbly. Uh, it was just us and and uh, in our office seven days a week trying to get this app and, and marketplace going. But here we are. We've, we've got a good marketplace happening. We're going to talk more about that in a moment, but I have to take you down memory lane if you don't mind. So we're going to take your videotape, rewind it, and we're going to stop at a time when you are pedaling your tricycle on your local street when you were single digit age old. So what were you thinking about back then? What were your interests? And uh, and we're going to go even further, like through grammar school, high school, college, where you are today. How did everything evolve to get to be where you are today? Yeah, you know, in elementary school, middle school, I was just your average kid, played sports. I played a lot of Nintendo. I, you know, I, I had, I played, you know, it's back in the eighties. So it was, it was a good upbringing, good, good childhood. Uh, and luckily I was dragged into entrepreneurship, kicking and screaming by my father. Uh, I think I was like age 11 or 12. He said, Hey, get off your butt. I've got a gig for you. You're going to go mow the neighbor's grass. And he made me go cut the neighbor's lawn. Luckily he did because uh, after I got done mowing that, that yard, I got paid 20 bucks and something about that just, just hit me. It it just stuck with me. I was like, wow. So you mean I can just do this and make as much money as I want? I don't have to hassle my folks for money. It was just an amazing, like epiphany that I had. And uh, I remember I I wanted like a a brand new pair of soccer cleats. And back then, like, you know, a pair of cleats was like 20 bucks. And the ones I wanted were a (laughs) hundred dollars. And I thought, wow, if I can just get four more of these yards, I can go get the cleats I want. And so I remember that very clearly, very vividly. And the first thing I did was I I made a bunch of door hangers on my old school desktop computer and uh, passed out flyers all over the neighborhood. And by the end of that first summer, I had maybe a dozen customers and I was doing, you know, 10 or 12 yards a week and making pretty good money for a 12 year old kid. And I actually just stuck with that little lawn mowing business all through high school and, and in through college, I put myself through college mowing grass and when I graduated college, I had to make a decision. Was I going to the job market and take a pay cut 
Right. Or was I just going to stick with this lawn mowing business? I didn't really want to be a lawn guy, but I made a little business plan. And uh, over a 15 year period of time, built that, built that into one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee, eventually getting it over 150 employees and, and getting it over 10 million a year in revenue. And, and in 2013, it was acquired by one of the largest landscaping businesses in the United States. So, you know, just going from me and a push mower as a kid, not knowing what the hell I was doing to run a real business. It, it was quite the journey. Wow. And you even sold that business back then, too. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But when you were going through grammar school, high school and college, you were still doing your lawn care business. Now, you weren't taking courses on mowing lawns because no college that I know of offers any curriculum for lawn mowing. So and I say that tongue in cheek. But what I really mean is what were you focusing in academically to assist you where you are today? Were you a marketing guy? Were you a business administration guy, accounting? What was your discipline back there or was just general business? Yeah. So going to school, I went to school for business and business administration. And and so it was kind of like, it was like a mental thrashing almost. I remember very clearly that here I am running a real business. You know, I had like two or three employees in college and I was running a real business and then I was in business school and there was like a disconnect between the two because business school would teach you all this theory. And here I am, I'm running a real business. And I'm like, that's not how it works. And, but then on, then on the other hand, I was learning real things that I needed to know, things like basic accounting, uh, basic business law, some of the marketing did port over, and also the ability to communicate in writing. So a lot of things I was learning did port over into the business I was running, but there still was a big disconnect. And I remember like, uh, you know, it was like a business policy class where, we were doing all of these like exercises and strategy sessions about what we would do in this hypothetical business. I'm like, that is not how it actually works because I'm running a real business. You know, at the time I was probably doing, you know, a 750 grand a year in revenue. So it was an actual little business. And uh, so it was funny. It was like a mental thrashing going through business school while running a real business and seeing the disconnects of, of, of what actually was real and what wasn't. Now, maybe business school has evolved in the last 20 years. I sure hope so. But back then, a lot of the stuff didn't really apply. <laughs> it was funny. Well, you know, I have the same sentiment as you do, because I think uh, academia sets you uh, set the stage up for what I would consider a foundational basis. But real life, it mirrors it to some degree. But Not exactly. Like the first thing I did out of college, I did utility accounting and you flip the balance sheet upside down, fixed assets lead because you earned a return on that. And then all the current stuff goes underneath that. But I want to take you through a couple of stories here that I think will help our audience. So you had a business and you sold it and then you started GreenPath. So let's go back. And your other business was landscape services as well, correct? That's correct. So tell me when the time came that you were thinking about selling and what the thought process was to prep it for sale. I don't think you woke up and said, hey, today I'm going to sell, put it on the market, and a week or two later it was gone. I think there was some prep that had to be done. So tell us about that process and how you were able to get it ready for sale, how you marketed the business for sale, what the pitfalls, if there were any during that process, and then what got you to start your new business. I know that's a long-winded question, but I think our audience would be very interested in knowing about that whole process. No, nah, it's a great question because it's, it's one that, you know, if you're dreaming of selling your business, you're going to go through this. And and for me, I didn't start the business and say, okay, in five years or 10 years, I'm going to exit. Ideally, that's what you should do. You okay. should lay out a plan, a five or 10 year plan, read the book built to sell four or five times and just work everything that that book talks about and just like do a proactive approach to selling the business. That's not what I did. I was running the business. The business was very much an extension of myself, who I am. It was almost like me and scaffolding around me. And so that's not how you should build a business if you want to sell it, but that's the way I built it. And I think for me, I, I reached a point of pl- of a plateau in terms of personal development, and I wasn't getting the purpose out of the business that I no longer was in the early days. So like, if you're doing a business right, you should evolve every two or three years into a completely different person. You know, in the early days, it was very much me and two or three people. And, you know, I was just trying to learn how to how to get basic unit economics nailed. And, and then I had like five or 10 or 20 people, and then I'm having to become a decent manager, decent leader. And then, you know, after 40 or 50 people, I'm having to train managers to be managers. And so it's like, it's almost like a video game. You're going through different levels. And I reached a plateau where I was no longer like growing personally. And once I hit that, I like, I I was stagnant for like almost a year. And I had this like, almost like desire inside of me to say, 
you know, there's something I need the next thing. What's the next thing? There's something more. I think this business has taken me as far as I can and I'm no longer having fun running it. And so once I hit that point, I thought, well, that I'm going to sell the company. I'm going to explore uh, an acquisition. And from the moment that thought entered my head to the moment that I actually got the business sold was over two years. And so it took a long time of reverse engineering a lot of the processes into the business that needed to be done, um, cleaning up a lot of things like you mentioned accounting earlier, um, getting everything in like gap accounting. And that took a long time. You're getting a lot of the team members in place that I didn't have. Just so grooming the business to where it could be acquired. And it was no longer like me at the center of it and everything depending on me. It was more of a business that could be bolted on into a bigger company. It took a long time. So ideally, you proactively work a plan, that an exit strategy, if you will. I did not do that. It was almost like rush offense. You know, I had a good business. We're doing 20, 10 million a year in, in revenue. And there was a lot of people interested in buying it. But when it came down to it, there was a lot of things that I had to kind of like, but like rush through at the end that I wouldn't recommend anybody try to do. It was tough. What were some of the biggest surprises that you had come up from the prospective buyer during due diligence? What were some of the things that they asked you that you said, you know, if I'd known that about four or five months ago, I would have had that all set for you or anything like that coming up during that process? Absolutely. Like, you know, if you're running a company and you're proud of it, it's your baby, you know, you do stuff for the long term. Like, for example, Let's say you've got a you know a landscaping company like I did, and you have the shop, and maybe the concrete floor in the shop. You know you want that concrete floor to look like a car dealership, and so maybe once a year you get it polished and repainted, and you get it shiny because because it's part of your company's values to have a really clean looking shop because you believe that that translates into quality services out into the real world, and so if you know if the shop looks clean, that might translate into a competitive advantage into the real world. That's just a philosophy that I might have as a business owner. None of that matters to an acquirer and you might spend 10 or 20 grand to, to clean up that shop. And then that like comes off of the, off of the net ink, off of the, the, the income statement. And so now guess what? Your company made 20 grand less than it could have. And also now that's times five or six. So yeah, that's a difference of, a, yep. that's difference of $150,000 on the final right. sales price. So that $20,000 decision you made to clean up the shop, cost you 150 grand at the sale. And and so you probably shouldn't have done that. And so that is a very, that's that's just one very small, small, small example. I don't want you to listen. I don't want listeners to listen to say, okay, don't clean up the shop. No, it's one small example of a decision you might make as the, I'm going to run this business for another 20 years versus I'm I'm going to sell this business in three years. There's almost short-sighted decisions that you might make trade-offs around. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. But the other thing that you highlighted, uh, Brian, is that you came to a realization that you weren't growing. And I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I think what you're saying, the passion of the drive was sort of escaping. Right. And I've had so many guests on this show who talk about to be successful, the passion of the drive's got to be there. You began to realize it wasn't there. It took a couple of years for you to sell. And, and you did, which is great. And you had a phenomenal sized business. So that probably was very attractive. But at that point, you realized that and it took you two years to get to the sale. Was it because you were marketing the sale or was it because you had marketed it too early? Or were you just saying, I just need to do this, uh, all these things before I put it on the market for sale? So in other words, yeah. my question is, were you listed for two years and it sold? Or did you say, I need 18 months to prep it and then list it for six and to sell it? How did that a little a little bit of everything. So one thing that I was smart about, you know, I made a lot of mistakes, but one thing that I made made a good decision on was I, I worked with a good broker that had a lot of experience in, in my in my vertical, had the Rolodex, so to speak. So he knew, like he's looking at, it, he's like, nah, you, we got to fix this, 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 and right. this. So that kind of enabled us to to avoid some of the pitfalls. So that took time. Yeah. And then, so then once we started uh, marketing the company, that took time, six months. And then from the time when we had like three, three term sheets uh, to negotiating those, to then engaging a buyer, it took another six months of due diligence and, and getting the deal done. So all in all two years, and a lot of this stuff kind of bled into each other. Like we were, we were still, we were still fixing things about the business while we were going through due diligence. And so all of these things should have been handled like on the front end. And I probably could have gotten it done in four or five months, um, but it ended up taking 24. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a good point. And uh, without, you know, 
pointing fingers or, or recommending anything. It's just planning is a, a, a smart process for running a business, planning to do anything. You need more planning to sell your business. You needed planning to expand your business. Now you sold your first business and now you started up a new one. So now this whole thought process is now reemerging. So now you got a brand new business. I'm not going to ask you if you're ready to sell or what your plan is going to be. But what have you learned from the first business that you eventually ran up to the point that you sold it to this new business, GreenPal? And of course, the uh, Uber Learn Care, uh, Lawn Care is definitely an up and coming thing. So that definitely the market wants that. So what are you thinking differently now as you start this business up versus how you started the other business up? Yeah, that's a great question. So after I sold the first company, I didn't have the idea for Green Pal. Like I, 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 almost, I, I even toyed with the notion of retiring. I, I tried it almost. I spent like six months and, and I just got bored. And so I, like, I, did, like, I didn't have to work anymore, which was nice. But like, again, that purpose wasn't there in my life. It, it, like, I needed something to like drive me forward through life. And the, the business for the last 15 years was that thing. And so it wasn't like I, it wasn't like I was just dying to start another business, but like, I was naturally inclined to. And so this idea for Green Pal, which is the Uber for lawn mowing, was an idea I had uh, while running the first company, just seeing like, the inefficiencies every day running that business. And so I thought, okay, I'll recruit two co-founders. We'll build this thing and we'll be off and going. And it might be two or three years and maybe we'll sell it or whatever. And boy, I didn't know what I didn't know. <laughs> and so it's like, it was almost like naivete as an asset. Uh, naivete as an advantage because, you know, a little bit of naivete is good because you get in there because you know how hard this stuff is going to be. You're not ever going to attempt it. And so, again, you know, every three or four years as an entrepreneur, as a founder, you should be evolving into a whole new person. Once again, I was able to get that out of, out of my second business because it's all sorts of new challenges. It's, it's product design, it's engineering, it's tech. And instead of working with mechanics, turning wrenches, now I'm working with engineers fixing code. And so it's all of these, all of these different challenges, all of these different things. And so, you know, looking back eight years, nine years later, I'm a completely different person than I was when I started this company. So there was a lot of things I was able to roll into it, like domain experience, knowing how the industry works, you know, basic management and leadership skills, basic strategy, um, how to how to ru run a tight PL, and all of these sorts of things that I've learned on the first business. But then there was this whole ocean of new challenges, new skills, and there just wasn't enough hours a day to learn the things I had to learn, you know. I mean, I, I still am working seven days a week in terms of learning new skills and, and, and learning from other practitioners and listening to podcasts, you know, like this one and trying to learn from people who have done what it is I'm trying to do. And that's one of the awesome things about, about business building is that it's going to require you to level up. It's going to acquire, require you to acquire these skills. And that's one of the things I love about it. So, you know, I learned a lot in the first business, applied it in the second one. And now here we are, we're eight years in, we're, we're profitable, I'm having fun. And one key thing I learned about exploring an exit on the first business is do not ever think about selling your business unless you are loving running it, because that's the time to sell it. If you hate running it, if you're not having fun, do not try to sell it. <laughs> you know? And so that's, you know, like, like by the time I had sold my first company, I spent two years grooming it. But after the end of those two years, I almost fell back in love with it again. <laughs> It was almost like I almost didn't want to sell it. So, so don't try to sell your business like, oh, I hate running this thing and it's losing money and, and, and I just hate everybody that works here and uh, you know the culture sucks. I, I got to sell it. I got to get out from under this thing. Do not attempt to exit the company in, in that mindset. Get everything fixed. Get everything perfect. Then sell it. You know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because um, – like you said, you almost fell back in love with the company you were going to sell. But ironically, and almost counterintuitively, that is the time you're going to sell. Because if you got the passion and the drive, most likely, and more often than not, the revenues are getting maximized, the profits are getting maximized. And of course, there's a multiple to revenues and profits that yield the value for the business that you sell. And uh, so that's a good point. And yep. you, you should be thinking about it before you that bubble, that balloon burst a little bit. Sell but it when you're that? having fun. Sell it when you love it. That, <laughs> as weird as that sounds, I swear to God, that's the, that's, the, that's the best advice I can give anybody. Sell it when I you love it. I agree with you there. I agree <laughs> with you. Now, let's go back to Green Pal. Now, you decided to start this business with two other co-founders. So that tells me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you had some subject, subject matter expertise that needed complementary 
other skill sets to help you to get to where you are. So what is Brian's expertise and what are your two co-founders expertise that together collectively got you to one plus one plus one equal five or six? Yes. Great question. First, I'll say this, try to go it alone. Don't get co-founders because most times it screws it up. Most times, you know, there's not alignment. And a lot of times I think if you're going to get a co-founder, you need to think about it with the same magnitude and weight as who you're going to marry and who your spouse is going to be. I think, because here's a couple of things. One, in the early days, you're going to be spending more time with this co-founder than you are your actual spouse. Two, if the business is successful, um, it probably is going to last longer than on average most marriages do. And three, it's harder to unwind a cap table, a business partnership, than it is an actual marriage in a weird way. And so it's like, think about it as the same like degree of seriousness as who you would end up like walking down the aisle with, because you really got to, you got to find your, your business your business soulmate. Um, and, and if you can't find your business soulmate, then go it alone. So me, I got really lucky. I, I had two people that I could trust that were just, they had a chip on their shoulder and they, they really wanted something more out of life and they wanted to go it with me and they, and they wanted to like get in there seven days a week and do whatever it took to be successful. And I knew so long as we had that, that we could figure out the rest. Mm-hmm. Ideally, if you're starting a business like a tech company like mine, you want a hacker and a hustler. So you want somebody that knows the tech and you want somebody who's just driven, who's a hustler, who's going to drive the business forward on that spectrum. I kind of like fall towards the hustler side. Like, like if things aren't moving forward and things aren't happening and we're not like getting stuff done, I'm pissed and I'm going to figure out where the log jam is is and I'm going to get that fixed. Like that's my only superpower is just like that consistency and getting the right people on the bus, getting the right people on the team are, is really kind of what I'm good at. And, 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 you know, I'm not some like wizard at this stuff. It's just consistency, diligence day in, day out and getting the right people on, on the bus is, is really what I try to strive at. Yeah. Brian, what I'm hearing you say as well is that you've got to keep your finger on the pulse. I mean, you just don't do things and let them go for four weeks at a time before you write back. It's almost a, a constant and perpetual monitoring to, to make sure you get to be where you are. So I've got a few more things I got to comment on because this is the first time I've heard these things. So I typically equate selling a business with selling a residential home. You're the first person to talk about business ownership and equate it with marriage, which I think There's parallels, too, because you're talking about a soulmate for a long period of time. And I get that. And then you're talking about hackers and hustlers. So these are all concepts that I haven't heard before. But the bottom line is the principles are all the same. You know, you have a specialty. If you can't do everything well, bring someone who can do it. And then that partnership that you're talking about with co-founders, it's got to be solid because it is going to be an integral part of the business going forward. So tell me a little bit more about that if I missed anything. No, absolutely. Like, don't start a business with somebody like the movie Saving Private Ryan or, you know, any, any movie about war that you can, that you can watch, like the one that just came out about World War I a couple, like, uh, last year, like those battle scenes, like don't start a business with somebody you can't imagine going th- through those battle scenes with because that's what it's going to be like. Don't start a business with somebody that you don't want to go through the lows with. Like when the times get bad and when nothing is working and you're pushing on a string and you can't imagine like doing it with that person, like you don't think that they'll be in there with you, then don't start the business because with them, because that's what it's going to be like. You're going to need somebody who is going to go through the lows with you because in the early days, it's going to be a lot of lows. And in a weird way, there's like a benevolence between the two of you. I know I felt this with my co-founders where, where it's like, it is almost like, uh, band of brothers in a sense that, you know, what got those, those soldiers through a lot of those experiences was their benevolence towards one another and not like retreating because of the, of, of, they know that their, their buddy will die. And so, so literally like, that's what like starting a business is like. And so you, you have to think about it in those terms that you are going to go through hell with this person. You can't imagine not doing it without them. And you know, they'll be right there through it with you. And that benevolence that you have towards one another is what's going to get you through a lot of those hard times. I don't, a lot of this stuff sounds extreme, but man, like, you know, breathing in life into an idea is, is hard and go it alone if you can. But if you find your business soulmate, do it with that soulmate. You know, the other concept that I'm hearing from you, and I'm paraphrasing again, what you're saying. So metrics are important because that's how you measure the success of your business. But what I'm also hearing you say, Brian, is that relationships 
are essential. And that almost could probably be more than half of what's involved in running a business. Because if you can't have a partner that you don't know, like, and trust, it's right. going to be tough to take it to the next level. And there are some like you who decided not to take on co-founders, but they knew they couldn't do it alone. So rather than have a so-called co-founder or co-partner or strategic partner, they're outside vendor relationships or outside consulting relationships that contribute, but they're not there day to day like you and your co-founders are. So sometimes that works better. Yeah, exactly. You don't, a lot of times, so it's, it's, it's not like, do I do co-founders? Do I not? like everything, it depends. If you can find the soulmate, do it because that, that'll increase your chances of success. But if you get that wrong, it's going to increase your chances of failure. If you don't find the soulmate, go it alone. And then like you said, really seek out the best outside influences that you can in terms of mentor relationships of people who have done what it is you're trying to do. Contractors of people who are really smart and maybe you can't afford them 40 hours a week, but you can afford them one hour a week and they can help guide what it is you're doing or consultants that can come in there and work with you for five hours a month and really help guide what it is you're doing. So if you can't find the soulmate, go after the best exterior kind of resources that you can in terms of mentors, contractors, uh, freelancers, and, and consultants to help kind of fill that void of what that co-founder might have done for you. It's okay. One or the other will work. But if you get the co-founder's decision wrong, then that'll screw up your business. And it's a lot easier to get it wrong than it is right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So let's talk a little bit more. We got only a couple of minutes here. Let's talk a little bit more about GreenPal. Now, it's almost identical to what you did before. It's, It's landscape services, but it's to another level. I heard the word app and I heard the word online. So it sounds like it's to another level, a higher technology level, if you will. So there are 200 users for your app. I'm assuming it's more than just in a local community. It's probably nationwide. Tell me a little bit more about GreenPal and how that all works. Yeah, GreenPal has 200,000 people using the app. So, my bad. Yeah, so as of right now, there's thousands of people using this app to find lawn care services, hire them, schedule them, pay them, and book them for the whole season. So it's a marketplace, kind of like an Uber or an Airbnb that connects buyers and sellers. So the two different kind of journeys in my business kind of lifetime have, you know, I, I was very much in it and now I'm on it. So very much, I had a landscaping company. Now I'm creating the marketplace that connects homeowners with local lawn care services. So we so, kind of have two customers almost. We have the homeowner that needs to get the service done. And then also the small lawn care services that operate their business on top of our technology. Right. So it's, it's like a, it's an order of magnitude more challenging than my first business was. I thought it was going to be more, I thought it was going to be easier. I thought, oh, it's software. You just write it and, and you know, it handles it. No, <laughs> it's 10 times harder than the first business was, but I'm loving it. I'm having fun. Yeah. Is it subscription based or is it per service based? How does it work from the provider and then the user basis? Yeah. So it's our job to power that relationship between buyers and sellers for the lifetime of the homeowner lives in the home. So they come on board, they get quotes for lawn care services, they hire the contractor they want to work with. If that goes well, if the homeowner liked the service quality and the price, they can just book them for the whole the whole year. And it happens every week like clockwork. So in terms of like the, an ongoing relationship, it's a subscription in that way. And so we power that as for the lifetime that the homeowner lives in the home. And then the, on the contractor side, they run their entire business on top of the app. So, you know, let's say they have a 50 customers, 100 customers, 200 customers. They're doing everything on top of the app. Here's where I got to be today. Here's the route between the stops. And here's all of the service expectations for each client. And then they upload the, a photo of the completed job every time they, they complete it and then they get paid the next day. So that's the one of the main yeah. uh, pain points we saw for contractors. They get paid quickly. Yeah. So basically you're a hub for the provider and the user together. But again, you're net, you're national. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. We're, we're, we're in every, every city in the United States, every major city. And we started out in Nashville, Tennessee, spent four years just in Nashville, Tennessee, yeah. making the app work correctly, making, delivering a consistent experience for buyers and sellers. And once we figured that out, it was kind of like a nail it, then scale it. Then we started going to every other city in the United States. Well, it sounds great. I wish I had more time to kind of ask you more cues and have you provide answers there, but we are at the tail end of our program. Is there anything we haven't mentioned that you think the audience should know about, either from your lawn services specific or business in general? Yeah, I think, you know, business 
has a lot of dichotomies, things that don't make sense, things that kind of you have to like hold in your head together. And, and for me, one of them is like, you have to have this huge, like audacious goal. It might be selling your business for five or $10 million, but you also have to think and act very small. And so it's like, it's big, it's this huge thing, but it's also like the little small things day in and day out. And like, you know, in the, in the course of selling my first company, it was that I wanted to sell the business for multi millions of dollars. But then again, I was having to do very, very, very small things over and over again that, that built up to, to get it there. And so, and so like, that's the, that's the, I guess the point I would leave listeners with is do the small stuff day in, day out, figure out what those things are. And that leads to the big stuff. You don't, nobody gets to skip over it. Yeah, totally agree. Well, that's the uh, the end of our formal part. How uh, how can we find out more about Brian and uh, your business, Green Pal, and anything else? So give us some links or phone numbers, emails. Yeah, anybody that wants to reach out to me, I hang out on Instagram more than anywhere. Brian M. Clayton, uh, just drop me a follow and a DM there. And then anybody that's listening to this doesn't want to waste time mowing your own yard, just download Green Pal in the App Store or Play Store. That'd be great. Thanks so much, Brian. I appreciate your, and by the way, the enthusiasm was beyond belief. So thank you for energizing me for the rest of the day. Thank you for your insights. I appreciate all your comments. Hopefully our learner or listeners are going to learn a lot by what you said, because there's practicality throughout whatever industry you're in. So thanks again, Brian. Listeners, thanks again for joining us on Building Better Businesses. We'll see you next time for another edition. Thanks so much.